myself, if I take the time and reflect on that which I am grateful for, that which I am thankful for, the ways in which I know I am blessed, it changes the way I look at everything else. It really does. And we don't do enough of it. And so this is going to be up for a while. So any day, um, even when you're in the building and we're not gathering like this, um, there's a gift tag back there. Looks like that. Looks like a gift tag. And there's markers. And you can write on it um, what it is you're grateful for. And then just tie it in a loop as you put it up on the trellis. And that'll just fill up as time goes by. Everybody got that? So that means as we start singing again, if you're like, oh, I'm going to go do that. You don't have to stay in your seat. You can feel free to go and do those things. So let me pray, and we'll continue to sing a little bit. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Uh, we thank you for every day of life you give us. It's a gift. Um, we thank you for the gift of, of family. We thank you for the gift of relationships. We thank you for the opportunity for us to gather in this space today because of you. You're the reason we're here. And um, Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness, um, that you are present in the highs and lows of life, in the calmy times and the stormy times, in the times where we're battling with issues with our bodies and um, battling with relationships that we have. You're, you're there in the midst of it, but you're also there in those times when we get to go on vacation and enjoy um, just the many blessings we have out there in the world. Um, so Lord, we're grateful this morning. Um, Lord, I do pray for those that are sick. I do pray for those that are struggling with their health. Uh, Lord, I want to lift up David to you who um, had his other leg amputated and um, is having to navigate through um, what life's going to look like for him. Lord, I pray that you'd be with him this morning, that he would not feel alone, but he'd feel a deep sense of your presence. Uh, Lord, I pray for the many conflicts that are going on in our culture right now, and you, you're well aware of all of it. Uh, Lord, I pray that um, peace and calm would come to that. It's, it's hard for us to live our lives each day knowing all of this stuff that's going on around us. And we can't, we can't ignore it. It's there. Um, but, but Lord, I know your, your heart's desire is that all of your people would be at peace. They'd be calm. And they'd be loving and kind to one another. And that's your heart's desire. So Lord, as we're in this space today, may we be reminded of your goodness may be reminded of your love, may be reminded of your light, may be, we be reminded of your hope, may we be reminded of your peace, may we be reminded of your truth, may we be reminded of your joy, may we be reminded um, that you are our life, and Lord, in that may you um, indwell in us in those ways that we might be who you are in the world that you called us to live in. In Jesus' name, amen. You are good, you are good. When there's nothing good in me, you are love, you are love. On display for all to see, you are light, you are light. When the darkness closes in, you are hope, you are hope. You have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling, you are true, you are true, even in my wandering, you are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing, you are life, you are life, and your death has lost its sting. You are more, you are 
Lord, I'm thinking about hugs, that song talking about your loving embrace. Um, Lord, I pray this morning we would know how much you love us and that you would hold us and hug us deeply and we would receive that. May we be reminded as we look back over our lives, the times that we have experienced loving embraces from people that we know who love us. And there's nothing greater in terms of your goodness is feeling your embrace. So Lord, may we recognize where you have been in our lives, your faithfulness, and that we would um, hug you back.
Father, we thank you for your goodness. You are so good. Thanks for chasing after us. Always chasing after us, even when we're running away from you. Whether we recognize we're running away from you or not. Thank you for your faithfulness and, and not giving up on us. And that in itself is such a gift. Your mercy and grace are so significant, and I'm so grateful for them. And, um, and that just shows how good you are. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so it is that time of the morning where we get to share what brings us joy. It goes right along with our gratitude trellis. So if you want to make your way that way too, don't forget you can. Um, we've been doing... We've been asking you to find someone who's not your age to share what brought you joy this week. We also have some faces who have not been here for a while and some new faces. So just, you know, find someone and tell them what brought you joy. Go ahead. Go now. Test, test. All right, if we can start heading back. 
So finish that conversation, which I love. I love all the conversation. You lost control. Yeah. That's, so you can, uh, and you could actually sit with the people you're talking with. One, one of these Sundays that's going to happen where you're, you're talking and you go, I'm going to go sit with you. Yeah. And then they'll never stop talking. And then they'll never stop talking. That's true. Much like now. <laughs> all right. So uh, Kristen's going to do our announcements this morning. All right. Good morning. I didn't actually say good morning when I announced the joy question. So good morning, everyone. I hope you've had a great week. Um, I have to set my coffee down. Hold on. All right. A few highlights from your um, handout this morning. If you didn't get one, just raise your hand. We'll make sure that we get one to you. Um, on the back. So July, we are focusing on rest. And so we're really hoping to encourage everyone to enjoy time with family if you're going on vacation, if you just need to relax and do nothing in your own house in the air conditioning, do that. Just take time to be still, to listen to where God is leading you. And it's very likely that he just wants you to be quiet so he can remind you how much he loves you. So, you know, um, take some time to really listen to that. So we're saying that we want you to practice our three Ps, which is play, pray, and proverb each day. So um, take some time for that devotional. I know life gets crazy, and sometimes it's easy to be like, oh, I'll do it later, and then we don't come back to it. So just being really intentional about having that rest and spending time with God each day um, as a church would be really amazing, and we can all, um, it'll be fun to hear stories of what God's doing in our lives if we start sharing about those moments. Um, another highlight is our annual Women's Weekend at Mission Springs. Yes, so fun. Coming up in uh, September, end of September. So um, ladies, sign up. It's a lot of fun. And it just occurred to me that I don't get to go. What? I signed up for a half marathon with my son, which I did a long time ago. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What a bummer. Oh, well... You guys can pray for me that weekend because it's going to be a rough one. We just, we're doing Big Sur. It's, all, it's like six miles uphill. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, anyway, that's coming up. And we're, our next announcement, do you want to, can you say peanut butter and jelly? So next week, our food focus is peanut butter and jelly. So if you would like to help out with the food pantry, peanut butter and jelly, go ahead and, and tell them. And then um, our connection card. I got it. Um, so, you know, it's a great way so we can know who you are, how we can be praying, and if you'd like to volunteer. Next up, we have Betsy coming for the kids. All right. All right. All right. Kids that go to the gathering kids, let's come up to the front. Hey, yay, yay. Awesome. All right, you get to go with Miss Patsy today. All right, Lord, we're, oh, first we're going to pray for these guys. Oh, wait, nope, I forgot something. You need to know their names because when they come out of class and they come back in here, you can say hello and what is your name? Skylar. Sunny. All right, now you know their names. Now I'm going to pray for them. All right, Lord, thank you so much for these kids and their hearts. And Lord, thank you for Patsy and Carolyn to go back there and be with them. And I pray, Lord, that they would know understand how much you love them in jesus name amen amen go, go, go. thank you betsy wasn't it awesome that skylar felt comfortable enough just to walk right up there and help lead worship this morning i think i think that may be our thing oh i need this so um one of the things that we talk a lot about around here is where are you seeing god at work in your life and our word for the year as a church has been engage, which means looking for where you see God at work in your life and around your life and joining him in that. And uh, we have a couple of people who've been living into that, and I want to interview them this morning as a, as a God at work. So, Matt, you can put that slide up. Never mind. Anyway, so there we go. So I wanted to invite Joan up and Med. Can you guys come on up? I'm going to interview you guys. Come on up. Let's give them a hand as they come up. 
So you, one of you can, you can pick a stool. Pick a stool. This is mine. There you go. There you go. Thanks a lot. So I'm going to give, I'm going to give the mic to Med first. But, um, <laughs> Thank you very much. So... Uh, so if you don't know these guys, these gals, these ladies, these young ladies, you need to get to know them. Um, they're really special. And I love the fact that um, as they've been trying to live out what we're talking about, they have become friends. They didn't know each other, and they were coming here, and now they're friends. So I want you to think about that. So I want you to listen. Uh, both of them um, have been discerning something that God has put on their heart, and they're acting on it. And it's impacting the lives of other people. And so let's start with Med. So Med, my first question is, so that they can get to know you, tell us briefly a little bit about Med. And you got to put that microphone up to you. Well, I'm an old white-haired lady to begin with. And yeah, eat that mic. Eat it, okay. There you go. Anyway, uh, I was raised in the South, so of course I was raised on good old-fashioned Baptist, Southern Baptist Church, strong. And we were raised with a lot of hell and damnation. So coming to this church and the love that Jesus shows is sure a lot different than what I was raised as a child. Even though it was a good education, I'm sure. But okay. So where do you live? Where do you live? Oh, I live in Gustine. She lives in Gustine, down the road. And what is your passionate hobby right now that you've been involved with actually for years? You've, the theater. So if you've been, been to the theater down in Gustine, she's deeply connected in what happens behind the scenes, right? Yeah. Well, I've been on stage a few times, yeah. but I prefer being backstage. More fun that way. So, so um, not long ago, Peter kept trying something to get us to do go to lunch Sunday. You guys remember that? He's trying to get us to live into that, live into that. And I thought, nobody's living into it, so I stopped Nobody talking about listens. it. But, thus Med. So Med, you want to tell us what you've been doing? What's been going on? Oh, it's not just me. It's, it's all of us. We started, Sue and I actually started going to lunch, and then we talked to some others, and they joined. The next time, there was five of us that went. And I think the last time, there was, what, 16? And today is go to lunch Sunday again, and we're going to the farmer's den, and I hope there's at least 16 of us for that. So think about that. Some ladies just went out to have lunch with some ladies, and then they invited other ladies, and other ladies, 16. And now they have to go to a bigger place because there's so many of you there. And what's happening is relationships are happening, friendships are happening, which is the whole point, right? And you get a chance to speak to people that you don't get to hear. You get to give them a hug and say hello, but to talk to them, find out what they like in life. When you're at lunch, you kind of set your hair down and, and you enjoy it. You, you find out about people. Good. Good. A lot of love. Awesome. Okay, pass that off to Joan. So, guys, just a reminder, this isn't for us. <laughs> but, men, we should, we should think about what we're going to do. Okay. So, um, so Joan, tell us a little bit about you. Well, I was, well, I was born in the Bay Area, raised there, and about 33 years ago, my family decided to move out the other side of the hills, and we followed suit, and it's been Luke Patterson. Okay. Mm -hmm. So do you have any relatives here in town? Most of them, yeah. <laughs> I encounter quite a few of them out there. <laughs> well, no, uh, I've, uh, I've uh, adopted most of the family here, but no, I have, uh, um, I have a son that lives here, and grandchildren, and daughters-in-law, and there's quite a few of them. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so you had an experience in your life that I think led you to um, doing something here, which I think is really, really amazing and important. And so maybe you could share um, what it is you do here on Wednesdays and what led to that. Well, what led to that was in uh, a day on May, actually it was a Sunday that I found out, uh, my husband died. And then three months later, I lost my son. 
And so uh, some people are able to grieve and do it on their own. I'm not one of those. So I was looking for help and looking for books. And out of the blue, uh, a girl that I really didn't know too well from high school uh, got a hold of me. And she'd been doing this grief share program in San Jose. And she sent me uh, all the information. And I shared it with the pastor that I was involved with then, and he decided that it was a good program and we should start it, and we did. And so we had the first one in 2007, and we tried to do the program twice a year until COVID hit. Um, it doesn't cure your grieving, it just gives you some tools to help you along, and it gives you a wisdom to know that some of the things that you're experiencing it's, uh, you're not going crazy. It's just part of the grieving process. And it's Bible-based, and it's, um, it helped me immis immeasurably, and it's helped a lot of other people. Awesome. And we're grateful for it. So that is here on Wednesdays at 10 o'clock. We just meet in the back and at the tables back there. And there's a, a number of women who have started to come, and it's open to both <coughs> men and women. And um, sometimes those tools are the important thing. So just as the pastor here, I just want to, many of us have been in the church a long time, and we wait for the church to program things that we think we need. And what we're trying to do here is recognize what is God up to in our lives and how can God use us in the lives of other people and allow that to be what we join in. And it's interesting, God provides everything that we need, it becomes fruitful, and it's sustainable. And that's how we're rolling here. We're not going to be that place that we have this and we have this and we have this because that's what a church is supposed to have. What if we join God and what he's doing? And you have examples of this right here. Okay, so I want to pray for both of you. I appreciate both of you. Thank you for listening to God and doing what he's put on your heart. And I look forward to hearing more that comes from it. So would you guys pray with me? I want to pray for both of them. Uh, Lord, I want to thank you for my friends. Uh, Med and Joan, I thank you for the love that they have for you and the love that they have for people. And Lord, I pray you would just continue to um, use them in the lives of others in the way that you already are. And we thank you ahead of time for the lives that will be impacted and changed by that. And I pray that you would bless uh, what's on both of their hearts. Lord, I pray that women would get to know women and they'd have relationships. We all need relationships. So I pray for that lunch today that it's rich and it's fun and it's filled with life. And I pray for those that come this Wednesday to, to work through their grief. Lord, I pray that you would continue to meet them and comfort them and restore them and redeem them so that they can continue to live a full life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, ladies. Give them a hand. All right. If you've got a Bible or you've got a Bible on your phone, I left my Bible at home, so I grabbed one of those Bibles in the back. Um, but if you need a Bible, you can go back and grab one. Maybe hold your hand up if someone else is going back there to grab one. Um, if you're on your phone, um, I use the New Living Translation to, um, to teach from. Um, I do use a lot of other translations as I prepare those so that you guys know that. Um, but this is the one I like to use uh, the most. So, um, 2005, in the month of August... Um, a huge hurricane um, hit the Gulf Coast called Hurricane Katrina. And when that, could, that hurricane hit, it was a Category 5, 170 miles per hour. And uh, many of us can remember back and know some of the damage of that. Some of you, as I look around, might have been fairly young and don't maybe remember that or know of it. But um, you need to know that something um, that happened in the midst of that hurricane. So Biloxi, Mississippi was the city that was at the center of it. It was the city that was hit the hardest. New, um, New Orleans was on the news all the time because of the water damage and all the flooding that happened, but Biloxi was the one that was the hardest hit. Before the hurricane hit, um, it's, it's kind of a peninsula that sticks out like this, so the coast is here and a bay comes in here. And right in this space right here, there were casinos on barges, there were casinos on barges, and all the people who lived in all of the homes in here, the majority of them were poor, 
And they were the ones that worked in the casinos. Um, when the hurricane hit, if you can imagine, the tide went up 100 feet, washed over that entire peninsula. Um, I heard stories of people that they didn't know to get out, and they were on their second story. I heard the story of this one guy holding his child like this for three hours so that they didn't drown. Okay. So needless to say, this area was destroyed. When you first saw pictures of it, it looked like an atom bomb went off, a nuclear bomb had gone off. It was just destroyed. Um, I had a friend who went immediately. He liked to do that. And so he went there immediately to help people, pulled his trailer. He's a construction guy and loved to cook. And so he went in to immediately start helping people. Um, I was communicating with him, and he told me, he said, Peter, you know, nothing's being done here. Nothing's being done here to help these people. If you want to bring some volunteers, just bring some tools and show up. There's lots of things that can be done to help these people. So we loaded up a trailer at Christmas time, and Betsy went with me, and we took, uh, I think we took five or six volunteers from our church. One guy was a contractor. And we drove all the way there, and I'll never forget the day we crossed the bridge and dropped down into Biloxi. It was as I saw in the pictures, but it was even more devastating when you could see it live. And even at that point, people had started to move all the rotting stuff into the streets for people to come pick up, and it wasn't being picked up. And it, it reeked, and there were X's on all the houses and buildings, and each portion of the X had a number in it and represented people who had died, um, pets that had died. I, it, it was just horrific. But when we dropped over the bridge, I looked to the left, and there was a casino, and they were installing brand new palms. The people who were making money off the people who serviced that made sure that next casino was built. It was ready to open. Meanwhile, all of this devastation was all there. Um, the government was slow in showing up. I mean, if you don't remember all of that, it was terrible. And people were displaced. They had no place to live. And then because people had been so displaced, they lost all their jobs because people from the outside came into work. We were there. We went there twice. Had the church not shown up, had the church not shown up, um, that area would have never healed and came back. Churches showed up. Volunteer groups showed up. They roofed houses. They rebuilt houses. They brought food. Um, they got to know the families that lost their homes and found them so that they could come back in. I heard of one church that um, had done a huge building campaign. They had bought land. Their church was growing, and they wanted to make a bigger building. And their hearts were so moved that they sold the property, and they used all of the funds from the property and all of the money in their building fund to go help people get back in their homes. The church showed up. In the midst of a terrible, horrific um, storm, the church showed up, and the church was the one that uh, restored that. And it doesn't get reported in the news or anything like that, but Jesus showed up, and lives changed. So we're in this series right now that I'm calling Go, Do, and Be, Living a Jesus-Shaped Life. And as you and I follow Jesus, we have an opportunity to experience Jesus in the midst of storms, storms in our lives, and to bring Jesus into the midst of the storms of others, storms that are impacting their lives in significant ways. And in that way, I believe we imitate the life of Jesus. And what that looks like, if you're being Jesus, you become this calming, peaceful, encouraging presence in the midst of a storm. So we're going to look at... Um, a small portion of John today. We're only going to look at four verses. We're in, going through the Gospel of John. Jesus is on his way to the cross. Um, last week, uh, Kristen talked about Peter's denial. Uh, before that, Jesus had taught the disciples as much as he could. He, he prayed for them. They had the Last Supper, washed feet, all of that. Jesus has been arrested at this point, and he's faced a religious court, and he was found guilty for just being himself. They use the word blasphemy. Okay, so that's where we are going to pick this up. So um, I'm in verse 28, and I'm going to read through verse 32, and then I'll pray. So Jesus' trial before Caiaphas had ended in the early hours of the morning. So he'd been arrested and put on trial all night, no sleep. 
Then he was taken to the headquarters of the Roman governor. His accusers didn't go inside because it would defile them and they wouldn't be allowed to celebrate Passover. The religion was so steeped in laws and rules about being clean that the people who wanted to deal with Jesus couldn't even bring him into the Roman building because it means they would be unclean, which means they couldn't do the religious practice that they had. So Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, what is your charge against this man? We wouldn't have handed him over to you if, we, if he weren't a criminal, they retorted. Then take him away and judge him by your own laws, Pilate told them. Only the Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. This fulfilled Jesus' prediction about the way he would die. Heavenly Father, we um, thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts and minds to receive something this morning just for us. And I pray that what I share this morning is truthful, helpful, and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I don't know if you know what causes hurricanes, but it's basically warm water evaporating and rising and then cool air coming in to take its place. And it just creates this this cycle of all this moisture going up and creating thunder clouds and it just continues and continues and continues and then because the earth rotates it starts to make this thunderstorm spin and it just builds and it builds and it builds and we're actually getting close to hurricane season and so you'll, you'll hear about hurricanes that'll, that'll happen. Florida gets hit by them all the time, right? So what, the reason I'm talking about hurricanes is you have two contrasting conditions that when they meet, it's catastrophic. Two contrasting conditions, hot air and cool air and movement, it becomes catastrophic. So I want to look at this moment with Jesus because it explains a lot. Jesus doesn't say anything and he doesn't do anything. He's there. But there is a lot going on here that I think you and I can learn from for in our own lives. So, Jesus' storm that he's in right now, in this moment that I'm reading from, is a clash of conflicting motives and opinions of the religious people and the political people. Okay? Two different entities. Pilate representing the Romans, and then these Caiaphas and the other leaders representing the Jews. And their motives right in this moment are being driven by fear. Both groups are afraid and what it's doing is it's starting to create this perfect storm. So think about Pilate. So Pilate was probably a soldier that was just appointed to this position and it's on, on his way he's hoping to be in a better place. And they placed him in the Middle East because it was the hotbed of conflict for Rome to manage. Think about today. It's still a hotbed of conflict. Um, Pilate had to, in his job, maintain control, maintain peace, no conflict, or he would look bad as a leader. And so the Romans not feeling really good about the Jewish culture because it brought all kinds of problems. So they didn't like to give the Jews what they wanted, and often they would do the opposite of what the Jews needed and wanted. And this governing body, the Romans, led by Pilate, had the power to enforce judgment and punishment on anyone who stood in their way. So they could take the life of anybody who stood in their way. So Pilate's basic intentions were, I gotta keep everything quiet here in the Middle East. And Pilate actually took great delight in um, snubbing the Jewish leaders when they would have requests. And he took great pride in thwarting anything that they were trying to do just to show that he was in charge. The religious leaders, we know as we've been going through the Gospel of John, they've been bothered by Jesus from day one because he's violating all the laws, he's violating all the traditions, he's being proclaimed as being the Messiah because of the things that he has said and done, and they want to kill him. They want to kill him. Their laws would say that he, they could stone him to death, but the reality was they knew how popular Jesus was, and they were going to look bad, and so they were hoping that they could just get the Romans to do their dirty work because they weren't allowed to kill people under Roman rule. Only the Romans were. So the Jewish leader's aim, eliminate Jesus as a threat without being to blame. So 
why is Jesus this huge threat? I was thinking about how to say this, because I've seen this in my own life. When Jesus is present, everything that's lurking in the dark comes into the light. Everything that's lurking in the dark comes to light. So whenever I invite Jesus into my life, whenever I invite him into moments in my life, everything that's in the dark now comes to light. I can't ignore that stuff anymore. And I love in this moment that Jesus doesn't say or do anything. He doesn't stay, say or do anything. He allows his presence to speak. Jesus said, I am the light in the darkness, and darkness doesn't like the light. His actions and words speak. He's breaking down every human wall with grace and compassion. And Jesus is willing, especially in this moment, because we know where the story is going, to sacrifice his life. To sacrifice his life so that everyone, everyone, not classes of people, everyone can live a full life. And he wants to restore humanity to be what God intended it to be. Jesus has used these words, and John wrote these words, that Jesus is ushering God's kingdom on earth. And Jesus' kingdom is about love, and it's not about fear. And so much of what's happening in our culture is driven by fear. Listen to N.T. Wright. He writes this as a guy I like to read. What Jesus intended, what Pilate intended, and what the Jewish leaders intended are rushing together into an event, a historic event. The greatest legal system in the world and the noblest religious system are meeting at the world's most historic moment. Together they stumble and blunder into an act so wicked so unjust, so unnecessary, and so indicative of their own moral bankruptcy that before all is said and done, we can come to the right conclusion. Jesus, the man at the center of the storm, is indeed dying for the sins of the world. A collision of opposing forces driven by love against forces driven by fear. So, we live in this world we live in today. I cannot I, I love to watch the news, and I cannot watch it. Our culture is in so much conflict. Our culture is in so much conflict. And some of those conflicts have leaked into our personal lives, our, our relational lives, our work life. It, it, it's so conflictive. And I believe this is what's at the root of it. And it started a long time ago. We are a very me-centered culture. We are a very me-centered culture. In other words, what I want and what I need and what I think has to happen. And if it doesn't, I'm afraid. Therefore, we live in fear to protect what I want and what I need and what I think. And here we are. (laughs) Perfect storm. And as followers of Jesus, in this storm, we're being challenged to live this way when the world's this way. And it it just makes it very tumultuous. I mean, I have a real hard time with it. I have a real hard time with it because of what everything's driven by. What happens is when what I want and what I need and what I think comes in contact with someone who wants something else and needs something else and thinks something else, all of a sudden, we have something. We have conflict. We have a storm. It can happen in in your closest relationships. If you're a parent, it can happen between you and your kids. Um, It can happen at work with employees. We see it happening everywhere when all of a sudden that hits. I know for myself that I have found myself, um, even in my own, what I want and what I think and what I need, coming into conflict with what Jesus is about, that there's a little bit of a storm inside of me. The Apostle Paul wrote these words, why is it I do the things I don't want to do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. And I've been sitting with that. And I realize so much of what I do comes from expectations 
that others have put on me throughout my life. Like, I need to be this way. And I've heard it from the church, and I've heard it from my family, and I've heard it from my friends, and I've heard it from culture. This is what I'm supposed to be and do, and yet I know that it's not. Um, and I know that that's where a lot of my personal struggle comes from. Where my storms come from is just living in the tension of that constantly and trying to arrive at a place. And to be honest with you, a lot of times I just want to ignore it. The Apostle Paul also said that um, as he followed Jesus, he struggled with something. And I don't know what he struggled with. They don't tell us. He says it was a thorn in his side. And uh, he said, God, would you take this from me? Please take this from me. Take this from me. And Paul says, God said, nope, not going to take it from you. I'm like, why, 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 why? I think it's so that we'll have greater self-awareness, greater self-awareness that we're not perfect and we don't always get it right. We have weakness. It keeps us there, keeps us from being prideful, super prideful, because we know who we really are. And how Paul deals with this, he goes, you know what, then I'm going to celebrate my weaknesses because God's grace is sufficient enough. And God will do greater things through all of my weakness. So I'm going to embrace this. I'm going to celebrate my weaknesses in the tension of what I want, what I need, and what I think. In every storm, a hurricane there is a safe place, the center, the center of the storm. The rotation of a hurricane um, is driven by a force that you can't see. As we have storms in our own lives, and we do have them, we need to know that the center can be a place of peace. It can be a place of and what it means is we have to begin to look for Jesus in the midst of the storm. Jesus is going to be that calming, peaceful presence in the midst of the storm that we're in. In a sense, Jesus is the eye of the storm. I need that for myself, but we also have the opportunity to be Jesus in the eye of the storm of other people. And, and how do we do that? It's interesting. The very things that Jesus was being condemned for are the things that bring peace and calm. When Jesus is at the center, he brings in love. He brings in joy. He brings in peace. He brings in patience. He brings in gentleness, kindness, and self-control. And that's all wrapped around in this idea of I'm going to love and I'm going to extend and be grace at all times in the midst of every single storm, and he can be that for us. So for some of us today, you might find yourself recognizing that there's a storm coming. I can see it. There's a storm coming. In my family, in my relationships, at work, I, I see the coming storm. I can see it. It's forecasted. It's right there. Some of us are in the middle of a storm right now ourselves. For some of us, we are the cause of the storm that's in us and around us. Maybe we are the actual storm. And I can find moments where I've actually been the person who brought in the storm. Some of us, we're just in the pathway of a storm that we have nothing to do with, but we find ourselves there. We need to go to the center of that storm and find Jesus there. And know that Jesus will be right in the midst of it. He's there. He can be the calming, peaceful presence that we need. And he does it with a self-sacrificing way. And in a sense, we have to die to ourselves so that we can live into the fullness of it. So that we can bring Jesus in there. It says this in scripture. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. God knows his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son Jesus. And that Jesus is the prince of peace. Joseph, the guy in the Old Testament, who we know is the guy who had the coat of many colors. Do you remember that story? 
He said this, God intends everything to work for good. I don't like storms in my life, but when they come, you need to know that God is going to take them and he's going to turn them into something good. If we will just endure it and do what's needed in the midst of that storm and look to Jesus in it. Joseph, if you remember, experienced betrayal by his brothers. They left him for dead. He was enslaved. He was falsely accused of something he did not do. And yet he never pushed back. He never fought it. He was a presence of peace and calm in the midst of what I would look at a lifetime of horror. But all of a sudden, at the end of the story, as you know it, he is in charge because of who he was of all of the food sources in the land at the time, and a famine comes. And Joseph is saying, God intended all of that. He allowed all that storminess in my life. I stayed calm and I stayed peaceful so that I would be here in this moment to do this. What man intended for evil, God just did an amazing thing with. So, I don't know what's going on in your life right now. Storminess inside, outside, around, in your relationships and family. Um, I know what's going on in a lot of your lives. Could you share it with me? And I know that, I know that stuff's there. And it, they are st- storms. But storms eventually hit land and they stop. They break up. Hurricanes, man, the minute they hit land, they start, they start losing it. So I want to encourage you to, to hang in there in the midst of the storm. Look for Jesus in the midst of the storm. Be Jesus in the midst of the storm. And you may find a calm and a peace that only comes from that. So my hope for all of us today is that we would find peace and calm in the midst of whatever storminess is going that made some sense. So that's what I had for us today. So as I always do, because I want you listening to God, what did you need to, what did you need to hear today? What did you hear for yourself? And then um, the bigger question is always, what am I going to do uh, with what I heard? So we're going to take communion this morning, as we always do. Um, Paul said in scripture that we ought to do it every time we're together, so we're together. And we're here because of Jesus. So I want to honor him and remember him. So um, I always am trying to discern spirit-wise who I want to have um, do communion this this morning, help us do communion. So um, my heart's telling me all the time. And you don't have to pick it up. You can just stand behind it. Can you do that? Okay, so you can get up and head over there. And um, Todd, would you serve communion this morning? Would you help us serve communion this morning? So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said... This is my body broken for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. And then he took a cup of wine and he blessed it. And he said, this represents my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin. And actually sin is what creates all the storms, right? Forgiveness for sin. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat, take and drink and do this until I come back. I come back. So as you come up and... um, Take communion this morning. They'll just say the body of Christ broken for you, and you can take a piece of bread, the blood of Christ shed for you, and you can dip it, and then you can take and eat and be thinking about maybe a place in your life right now where you just need some peace and calm. (laughs) Jesus, will you bring peace and calm to this just for yourself? So um, everybody's welcome to the table, so you can come up whenever you're ready.
blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Washing and waiting, looking above, filled with His good. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Let me pray a blessing over you guys. Feel free to hang out and um, don't feel like you got to rush off. Amen, amen. And let's begin practicing those three Ps that Christian, Kristen mentioned. Proverb each day beginning July 1st, which is coming up. And look for an opportunity to play. And our prayer in the midst of play is just looking to see God in our play. Right? Yeah. All right. Heavenly Father, I want to pray a blessing over us all as we go. May we know of your peace and your calm in the midst of our lives. May we bring peace and calm and gentleness and kindness, um, self-control and love into the lives of others. May we be the gift of grace in the midst of the storms that we're in or the storms around us. And we do this, Lord, because we know of the joy that is set before us. Jesus endured the storm because of the joy set before him. And may we live with that joy that we know is coming. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
All right, have a great day. Enjoy.